first of all, I would like to thank uh, the organizers for allowing me to present this work. This work was published uh, uh, almost two years ago now in PNAS, and it uh, was led by Andrew Zamid Manjon, who was my student postdoc and uh, um, is now at the University of Bristol, soon to move to Australia. And uh, this is a talk about, uh, let's say, social interactions. So it's conflict are social interactions of a sort. And uh, I would like to give you some, it's an applied talk. I would like to give you some motivation and also uh, some of the further work that we've been doing. With the light, uh, in, in the light of this being a methodological community, I'll uh, also explain a little bit more the methodology than I would normally do. Uh, it's nothing else shattering, uh, but we think this could be a, a reasonably general approach to spatial temporal modeling. But first, I wanted to uh, say some words about a question that a lot of people ask me. It's like, well, how the hell did you end up doing something on the Afghan conflict? Because uh, most people that, well, the people that know me know that I generally earn my bread by modeling biological data sets, not social sciences and certainly not conflicts. And the answer is just this was uh, a piece of luck. So it's been a sequence of uh, interesting developments. So Andrew was uh, co-supervised by myself and uh, Visakan, but Visakan became head of the department, so he didn't have any time for his students really anymore. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were interested in point processes in a, in a biological context, um, primarily as models of spiking neurons. But uh, a joint friend, Mike Dewar, who is now in New York working for the New York Times, uh, has always been interested in uh, uh, visualizing and looking at data. And when the WikiLeaks data set came out, he made a very interesting, I see someone uh, that probably was in the audience at that talk, he made a, made a very interesting talk and the visualization posted it online and went somewhat viral, so he thought he would send me the link and we watched it with Andrew and we thought, well, maybe we could use some of the models that we've been using for neurons for this stuff as well. And the bottom line is that, you know, this is my acknowledgments, nobody, I didn't write a grant to do this and uh, uh, there is no need to write grants to do fun work, thanks to the University of Edinburgh, I guess, to allow, uh, for allowing me to do curiosity-driven research still. So, into the motivation, okay, so this is a talk about conflicts. Generally, there hasn't been a lot of data about conflicts in the past. The data that was uh, obtained was generally obtained in a qualitative way through intelligence, and this was a common thread to a lot of the social sciences. They were reasonably data poor, at least when it came to explaining human interactions. So I've sat into uh, you know, talks at NIPS as late as five or six years ago when people went on about the monks data set. For people that have not heard about the monks data set, this was a monastery in the US with a community of 20 people and someone kept a diary. And this was one of the best accurately recorded social sciences interaction data sets. It was a very small scale object and uh, uh, nevertheless very interesting. But of course things have changed dramatically and um, the way they've changed dramatically is that now uh, we have essentially the internet and we have social networks and uh, these are images from recent conflict or conflict-like situations. So who knows what this image in the middle is from? Let's do some interaction. Egypt, Egypt correct. This is Tahrir Square. Who knows which image, uh, where this, does this come from? London, yes, some people here have grown up very near there. Anyway, what these things have in common is that they all provided us with a large amount of somewhat unstructured data, so, but still data about what was going on, and generally, particularly in the WikiLeaks scenario, they gave us spatial temporal time-resolved data. So they told us where events happened and when they happened. And of course, when we start having data, and we start having data on this scale, we can look at the data and try to do things. And we were not the very first to, do, to try to do that, but we were still in the first wave, I would say. So what have people done before us? Well, the first thing you can do with data, of course, is like look for patterns, so do some clustering and try to come up with definitions of hotspots of a conflict. A very interesting uh, paper that was published roughly at the same time in 2010 um, 
took a, a pure signal processing approach. So they tried to model as a black box the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and they would say, what was the frequency response of uh, a terrorist attack in terms of retaliation events? Now, it didn't take a long time for physicists to find uh, a scale-free network in these and the power law, and they published it in science uh, pretty much at the same time when we were submitting our paper, which didn't help. Um, but uh, from our point of view, the closest piece of work was uh, some work from some social scientists, uh, this guy, um, Weidmann, who has uh, uh, both a PhD in computer science and in social sciences, they were using autoregressive models to model the tribal, the dynamics, spatial temporal dynamics of the tribal conflict in Burundi, which is still on the data poor side. WikiLeaks enabled us to go a lot further, and the model, modeling framework we used was, let's say, Bayesian hierarchical models, where we posit a spatial temporal dynamics and we try to explain the dynamics through parameters that have interpretable meanings and we try to explain the events through this. And of course the challenge here, I mean I said it's an applied talk, but we still get data which is consisting of tens of thousands of spatially and temporally resolved events, and they're placed over a whole nation. So I think you know it could fit into the big data framework, if we want to say that. It's difficult to get spatial temporal models to scale in this way, although recent uh, progress has been made. Okay, so, we have a, uh, we said we want a, a Bayesian uh, hierarchical framework. So the first level at which we look is the level of the data. And this is a slide showing you events in the WikiLeaks data set, the Afghan war diary, in a week. So this is Afghanistan. I'm not sure whether you can see it. Afghanistan has got one main road that goes all around Afghanistan, pretty much like Iceland, I think. And uh, a lot of things happen around, around this road. But if I looked at another, uh, I mean, there's clear patterns emerging from just looking at this picture, but if I look at another week, there will be slightly different patterns. So there is certainly an element of randomness. The first suggestion that comes out of this is that possibly a good model for the data layer would be a subset of random points. And we're fortunate there are very beautiful mathematical objects, which are called point processes. Now, if you're not familiar with point processes, the most simple one is the Poisson point process. You're probably all familiar with the Poisson process in time. The generalization to space is uh, trivial. Basically, we assume always that there is an intensity function. The probability of finding a certain number of events within a certain region is given by a Poisson distribution which has got as parameter the integral of this intensity over that region. Now, a corollary of this is that if you look at two separate disjoint regions, the random variables, how many events here and how many events here, will be independent. And that's a very strong uh, constraint. However, the beautiful thing is that, I mean, initially when I came to these processes, it seemed to me that a random subset of points of a space would be a very intractable object. But in fact, given a set of points, we can associate with it a likelihood, which is a fairly tractable object. Now, these are very important in a lot of things that people in machine learning do every day, like non-parametric base, and I would love to be able to talk to you at length, but instead I will refer you to a really very beautiful book by John Kingman, which was written over 20 years ago, but it's still a classic, and it's very small, so even I managed to read most of it. Okay, so I said that uh, Poisson processes imply that there's independence, statistically between disjoint sets. And that could be a problem, because if I have a very problematic region in conflict terms, I would expect that nearby regions will share a similar dynamics. So the independence process property is too strong for many practical applications. And the idea to get around this problem was, again, a very well-established idea in uh, spatial and uh, spatial temporal statistics, is the idea of the Cox process. So we introduce a hierarchical model, and we have that the uh, intensity function is itself a random function. And in the simplest uh, scenario where we work in, we could assume that the, the logarithm of the intensity is a Gaussian process. And of course, Gaussian processes are very nice. Why are they very nice? Because they also arise as stochastic processes, dynamical stochastic processes. So we can think about encoding some dynamics into this Gaussian process 
and then crank the hierarchical Bayesian uh, framework to try to extract information about the dynamics of the patterns. This is also quite well-known stuff, how to do these things, and I'm not going to speak a lot about it, but I will refer you to another very nice book, which is much more recent. I think it's going to become a classic. It's by Cressy and Wickle. And this is a lot thicker, so I only managed to read two chapters, but uh, it's a good book. I can recommend it very much. And um, what does this book tell us? Well, it gives us a recipe of what kind of models we can go and take. And the most general possible stochastic process in space and time, at least in my opinion, is something called a, a stochastic partial differential equation. So we are probably, most of us, familiar with stochastic differential equations. So these describe the evolution in time of a random variable. We are also probably also familiar with partial differential equations, which describe uh, the space and time evolution of a deterministic function. And uh, in this case, we are trying to describe the space and time evolution of the random function. We can think about them as a, a very, very long, infinite system of stochastic differential equations, where now the random variables are labeled by an index, which is the space index. And uh, for this to make sense, there are conditions on the noise, but I'm not going to go into the technicalities. Um, of course, these are very complicated infinite dimensional objects. Already, a stochastic differential equation is a fairly hairy piece of work, so we are looking for a finite dimensional approximation to these objects. And uh, taking continuous time systems and reducing them to finite dimensional objects is fairly simple. We discretize time. We don't step out of the time honored Euler <laughs> tradition here. Also, because the timestamps that we get for our events are often discretized already. In space, instead, we would like to maintain at least a semblance of continuous space. So we don't want to come out with discontinuous functions that tell us that something is very bad here and it's very good here. So we wanted to project the uh, spatial aspect onto a finite dimensional subspace, but retain continuity of the sample trajectories. And to do that, the obvious thing is to use basis functions. So basis functions, most famous of them are the Fourier transform. In this case, this is not particularly appropriate. We wanted to use uh, compact support things that gave us a sense of localization. And then one of the first questions that we have is how do you choose the, the basis functions? There are several heuristics. We came up with another heuristic, but we kind of like this heuristic, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about this heuristic. And uh, the idea is basically you have a Gaussian process, a Gaussian process changes with a certain length scale. We want the basis functions to be narrower than that length scale, otherwise we're going to lose information by Shannon theorem. So how do we do that? There are non-parametric estimators of these uh, length scales. So here, maybe we cheat from a Bayesian perspective. We use the data to kind of inform how to uh, constrain our model. And uh, one important concept in uh, point processes is the concept of the pair autocorrelation function, which is essentially the correlation at different spatial locations in the intensity. And this is closely related to the, uh, if the logarithm of the intensity is a Gaussian process, this PAC function is very closely uh, related to the covariance of this Gaussian process. The beautiful thing, as you see, the, the PAC is defined in terms of expectations, so if, if we have data, we can find a sample estimate of this, and if we find a sample estimate of this, then we basically know what is the length scale with which the Gaussian process is varying, and that gives us a hint about what should be the width of the basis functions onto which we project. So the example is given here, how exactly it works. So this is actually all the events in the Afghan war diary <coughs> plotted onto Afghanistan. We can look at a sample estimate of the autocorrelation function. We did it for different years so that we would get a somewhat robust estimate. It seemed to have roughly the same spatial characteristic, and we chose something that was a lot narrower. And this resulted in just over 100 basis functions covering most of Afghanistan. We threw away places where there were no events, like the top of the mountains, because they create some problems in the model estimation. Oh, I'm already five minutes. Once you do that, you end up with a something that is very well known, which is uh, something that I've always called a linear dynamical system, but I heard it's a auto vector autoregressive model. And uh, we have a nonlinear observation, which is our Poisson likelihood, 
but that's not a big problem. We have a lot of uh, good methods to handle these in engineering. And the way we do inference, we perform variational inference. We are interested in reporting uncertainties over the parameters because, as I said, these could be interpretable. And, uh, um, you know, I have 25 minutes, not 20 minutes. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that, but uh, so, uh, I, I think it's a bit more than... <laughs> <laughs> no, you scared me very much there. Right. Um, no, no, no questions. Um, Anyway, <laughs> so <laughs> we, uh, we used a variational approximation where we factorized uh, the posterior with an approximating posterior that was structured, so it kept the dynamics and a posterior over the parameters. Okay, so now I come to tell you more about the data and the problem itself. So the problem is making a model of the WikiLeaks data set that described the Afghan war. And uh, this is a fairly large data set. It's about 70,000 points, each annotated with a timestamp and a GPS position, but also annotated with sometimes much richer annotations. We completely disca discard the annotations like the type of event. We just look at whether information could be extracted from the dynamics in the patterns of points. And uh, again, we used the data to uh, suggest a model. We did several tests about uh, what kind of dynamics seem to be present. So we looked at relative increments. They appear to be uh, Gaussian distributed. So we proposed a geometric Brownian motion prior. And uh, once you do that, as you notice, the geometric Brownian motion has got an increase in the intensity, which will be exponential, but is space dependent. So we allow for spatial heterogeneity, and we allow for spatial heterogeneity also in the uncertainty in the dynamics. And once we run our method, we can basically, com basically come up with estimates of these quantities, which may be of interest. So for example, if we look at the growth coefficient, we have a spatially distributed growth coefficient, spatially varying growth coefficient, and we see some things that are not immediately apparent if you just cluster the points. Why? Because, for example, these regions here that had very fast growth, had fairly limited number of events, at least to start off with. So they raised from uh, a frequency of a few events per week to about 20 to 30 events per week towards the end of the WikiLeaks period. So these were not picked up as important regions by anyone. The Kabul region, which was important instead, doesn't have a dramatic coefficient of growth. Things have been pretty bad all the time there. This is Helmand. Uh, people from the UK hear a lot about Helmand. This was bad and was getting bad very fast. But also we can look at the uncertainty in our model. So this would be the volatility. And so we see that some of the regions which were growing fast don't have a lot of uncertainty. So things were growing and we were pretty certain about how they were growing. Here things in Kabul were growing, but we didn't, weren't growing that much, but we were very uncertain about predictions. And here in Helmand things were growing very fast and we're also very unpredictable. So this is a really not a very pla nice place where you would want to be. Of course, these are interesting kind of post hoc analysis we could do, but the, the nice thing would be is there, you know, a predictive power in these kind of models. And there is some predictive power. So how do we go about to do our predictions? So WikiLeaks goes from 2004 to 2009, but there are all sorts of other organizations that collect related data. In particular, um, non-governmental non organizations have their own office that checks how many events happen. These are only violent events, so it's a different kettle of fish, but we somewhat made them comparable to the uh, WikiLeaks data. And then what we could do, we could predict from our model, simulate many possible 2010s, we simulated 10,000, and look at what the median predictions would be in each province, because the data the validation data is aggregated at the province level, and we got a very nice correlation between the medians. Of course, being somewhat Bayesians, we don't believe in point estimates, so we went and looked at the um, actual distributions, and, and so this would give you the calibration. So the, the black here is the actual reported, uh, is the actual median prediction, and the green is the reported number. And uh, the, the box and whiskers plot gives you basically the distribution of our predictions. And we see that in about 50% of the cases, the actual reported number falls within between the 75th and the 25th percentile. Now, one reviewer comment was, well, 
you know, you get it wrong about half of the time. <laughs> well, <laughs> it takes some politics to reply to reviewers sometimes. Okay, so that's uh, all that is in the paper, and there is a lot in the paper. All the methods are described in the supplementary material, which is quite long. I apologize for that. What have we been doing after that? Well, I did mention that the, uh, the basis function selection was made under an assumption of homogeneity, and that is not true. So there are some areas in Afghanistan where we have not many points, some areas where we have a lot of points, and in some areas we need a much finer spatial resolution. Also, if we get to a finer spatial resolution, we could maybe say something whether there are spatial dynamics in a more uh, marked point. So we try to infer, let's say, a network of how the uh, um, insurgency was spreading. We can't do that for all of Afghanistan because we don't have enough data, but we can do that where we have a lot of data, for example, in Helmand. And the idea is to use finite element methods. These induce sparsity. This was a, a, a key result in RSSB by Lindgren and collaborators. But in a dynamical system, that's not enough. So you can say your generator of the Markov chain is sparse, but once you iterate, you will get to non-sparse probabilities. So we have to further approximate, and what we do, we use a message passing <coughs> approach, and we force the messages to be sparse. And that keeps the computational costs quite low. So we can go to grids that look like that, which are very, very fine. And I can show you if this works, which it did a minute ago, um, what kind of things we can get. So this is um, courtesy of one of the sponsors of the conference, Google, um, Google Earth. You can plot your things on Google Earth, which is really cool. Um, so this is what happens when you um, open Google Earth. And uh, now I can put the grid. On here, it will go over Afghanistan. And this is the Helmand region, and we put, as you see, quite a fine grid over the Helmand region. And what we're interested in is trying to see whether there is a network, how the insurgency is spreading, and that would be in the inferred A matrix. And, you know, pleasingly enough, the insurgency, I mean, this is perhaps obvious, is spreading along a major road and also spreading along... Uh, a river valley. But of course, we didn't tell the model that there was a river there or that there was a road there. So this was entirely recovered from the data. So this is all I had to say. Uh, I'll go back to the presentation now. And so I think you know this could be a fairly reasonable uh, framework to handle large uh, spatial temporal data sets. Uh, I think, you know, people that have been just looking at summary statistics or clustering or visualizations have lost a trick. They should be able to use more advanced statistical techniques uh, for large scale spatial temporal data sets. And uh, uh, that's all I had to say. And I'll stop by putting up the references. So this was the paper, the main paper, and this is the new stuff. Thank you very much for listening. So we have time for v one very quick question. Yes. When you compute your per correlation, yeah. so you assume that you have forbidden distance, but your road is not a line. Yeah. And moreover, you may expect to have uh, an isotropy due to Kabul. So how do you correct or do you take into account that? Right. So, so we, we have some, uh, some things like the, uh, for example, the Kabul effect we have some additional covariates that are fixed effects in the model, which take into account uh, known effects like uh, population density, distance from the, um, um, the boundary with Pakistan. The anisotropy problem, yes, there is a question how much you want to tell your model and how much you want to get directly out of your model. So uh, we didn't put the road. We wanted to recover it a posteriori, for example. So these are kind of choices that you know we could have done differently. You're right. Another question?